Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to do a review of a mini PC, and it's this one here. It is called the Minis Forum UM690. Now, if you've been following along to the cinematic universe that I've been making about these mini PCs, you may actually recognize this one because this is the fourth model that I've reviewed with this exact same shell. Now, I'm a pretty big fan of this shell, like I've mentioned in my previous videos. It has a nice and compact size to it, but it also has space for a two and a half inch hard drive inside as well. In addition, it comes with a little stand so that you can rest it vertically in case you don't have a lot of desk space, which is really handy. And so over the past few months, Mini's Forum has been releasing new models with this product, but basically just upgrading the chipset and the features inside. And I think this model here, which is the UM690 we're reviewing today, we've actually got even further when it comes to performance because this is the first one that has the Ryzen 9 6000 series chip inside. And so I'm pretty excited to see just how much power we can squeeze out of this little guy. Now, this isn't the first time that I've introduced this particular chipset with my audience because we've already tested one other mini PC, this one here, which has the exact same chip inside. And this device is made by B-Link and I like it a lot as well. In fact, both of these are very good. And at the end of this video here, I'll do a quick comparison between the two. But if you're looking for a little bit of a tease, my end result is gonna be that they're both very good, but they do have two different purposes. One is smaller and one's a little bit more luxurious. And so in this video, let's go ahead and take a look at the UM690 and see what it can do. Without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, let's get started with the specs. Now the mini PC we're looking at today is the one on the far right. And as you can see, it's using the new Ryzen 9 6900HX CPU. This one has the same amount of CPU cores and threads as the previous model we tested, which is the UM590. But the thing about this chip is that it has better integrated graphics. We have a Radeon 680M inside with 12 different graphic cores. And as you'll see when we get to the PC game and emulation testing, that does make a big difference. Now, in addition to the graphics, we have bumps in the other specs too. For example, this comes with DDR5 RAM clocked out at 4800 MHz. In addition, we have a faster M.2 slot capable of PCIe 4.0, and the UM690 has a USB 4 Type-C port. That means it's going to be capable of Thunderbolt 4 as well as 8K video out of that one port. And thanks to that Thunderbolt 4 connectivity, you'll be able to plug in an external GPU if you'd like. And then finally, for its thermal cooling, they use a liquid metal solution. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now in terms of pricing, this starts out at $499 for the bare bones version. That means it's not going to come with any RAM or a hard drive. Now the one I'm testing came with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage, and that caps out at $650. And that's kind of the price point I'm looking at here, about $650 altogether for this mini PC. Of course, if you already have some compatible RAM and storage available, you could get it for cheaper. But also bear in mind that if you buy the storage solution from Mini's Forum, it'll come loaded with Windows 11 Pro. And so for me at least, I think that 16 gigs of RAM 512 gigs of storage and a Windows 11 Pro license is worth that 150 bucks. But of course, if you have cheaper access to any of those components, then this might be a better deal to get the bare bones one. And so as we do the unboxing here, just a quick disclaimer that this was sent to me as a review unit. No money was exchanged in any way. They're not seeing this review ahead of time and all opinions are my own. Inside, you'll find a quick start guide as well as a vertical stand. Additionally, we have two HDMI cables. One is shorter in case you wanna use it with a Visa mount. And then we have a 120 watt barrel plug power supply. Additionally, it comes with that Visa mount if you want to mount it onto the back of a monitor. And it also has some rubber feet that you may need to replace if you get inside the machine. And finally, we have a SATA connector for a two and a half inch drive if you'd like to add that to the mini PC. And so here's the big reveal. It's a little bit anticlimactic because I've already unboxed four of these different models, but it still looks really nice. As you can see, we have a little bit of front IO here and a lot of ventilation around each of the sides. So let's take a look at the back first. We have that power port, then two and a half gigabit ethernet, and then we have four USB-A ports. These are USB 3.2 Gen 2. And finally, we have two HDMI ports. These are 4K 60 Hertz. Additionally, on the sides, we have more ventilation here. And now let's talk about the front. First and foremost, we have that USB 4 port. This is gonna be capable of 8K video at 60 Hertz. And of course, you could plug in an external GPU. Additionally, we have a USB-C type three data port right here. Then we have a headphone microphone jack and the power button. Not a lot going on in the top here, but let's take a look at the bottom. Here we have the screw holes for the Visa mount and then four different rubber pads. And unfortunately, in order to access the internals, of the device, you will have to pull these pads off. And this is why they supply extra rubber pads in case these lose their stickiness over time. Either way, it's just four Phillips head screws. And here on the bottom, there's a little slot. And if you use a guitar pick, you can just pop it right out. And so here are the internals of the machine itself. One thing to note here, they are using brand name components. So we have Kingston RAM right here. 
Additionally, for my review unit here, they are using Kingston branded storage, but I was told that the retail units will actually use a faster spec storage than the one I'm using here. So you should have faster read and write speeds than what I got in my testing. The device also has Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth 5.2, and this is the same internal chip that they've been using on all their other models. It works great. Now here in the top left is that little SATA connection. So if you took a two and a half inch drive, you would plug one end right here, and then you would connect the other end to a two and a half inch drive and then mount it to the bottom cover here. And I've shown this off in my other videos using the same model, but it's a very easy process. And so just like that, you can expand your storage really easily on this machine. Now I generally don't tear down a machine more than what I just did, but because this is using liquid metal for its coolant, I do want to take a look at the other side. If you follow along to mini PCs like I do, you may remember that a couple years ago, one of the models that Mini's forum released had some issues with its liquid metal. And it turns out their earlier method of applying liquid metal actually resulted in some liquid metal getting onto the motherboard itself. And that could cause plenty of issues like shorting out your motherboard. Now it's been years since then and Mini's forum says that they've changed the way that they apply the liquid metal. But just to be safe, I did want to check and yeah, I don't see any liquid metal on the motherboard at all. Now personally, I don't want to tear this down any further because I don't know how to apply liquid metal myself. But at the very least, it does give me confidence that the liquid metal application process done by Mini's forum does seem to be legit. Okay, so putting the machine back together here, I did want to test one other thing, and that is what it looks like here with a vertical stand. And I've shown this off in other videos as well, but I do want to give you an idea of what it's going to look like. Now, personally, I don't use the vertical stand. I like how it sits horizontally, and I have enough space for that. But if desk space is a premium for you, and that's one of the reasons maybe you're looking at these mini PCs, then yeah, you can see right here just how small it gets when you have it on the stand. Regardless, I think this mini PC is really nice and small, so even if you just lay it flat like me, or you put it in the vertical stand, it's not going to take up much space at all. So now let's talk about its size relative to something else in the real world. For example, here's a stick of grass-fed butter from Costco, and as you can see, it's about two sticks altogether in width. And for a more practical comparison, you can see it's a little bit larger than an Xbox controller. Now, you may have seen this footage in some of my earlier videos, but here is an older model with the same shell here compared against some other Mini's forum PCs that were released in this past year. And so you can see it is quite a bit smaller than these other two models here in the middle, which are a little bit more powerful because they actually have GPUs inside. And of course, it's just dwarfed by my full-fledged micro ATX desktop that you see on the far right. And so in conclusion, if you are looking for a very small mini PC and you do want to have some hefty power to it right now, this is your best bet. So I think that's pretty good when it comes to the externals. Let's talk about what it's like to actually use the computer. We'll start with some CPU testing. Now, when we're sitting at idle, I would say you can expect between 45 and 50 degrees Celsius on the CPU readout, and it'll probably draw between three and five watts of power directly from the CPU. Now, when you start to put it under a load, like here with Cinebench, you can see that it'll bump up all the way up to 65 watts here in the beginning. However, I found that within the first minute or so, it will drop down to about 54 watts of power, and then after about two minutes, it's gonna drop down to 45. And so that seems to be the most common thread that I've seen so far, is that it'll boost up really fast in the beginning, but then stabilize around 45 watts altogether. And when you're getting that consistent CPU power draw of 45 watts, I have seen the max temperature get to about 80 degrees Celsius altogether. And so I would say the cooling performance that we're getting with this machine is actually pretty great. The fact that we're getting a 45 watt power draw, but still keeping the temperature at around 80 degrees max, I think that's really pretty good for such a small form factor. And to top it off, I found that under a 100% load, the CPU fan is actually not that obnoxious at all. In fact, I would say the overall sound is relatively pleasant. Let me give you a listen right here. And so overall, I would say it's not a very loud computer, and we're still getting some really great performance inside. Speaking of performance, here's the Cinebench score. It is 12,434 points. And we'll talk numbers later on in the video here, but for now, let's talk a little bit about the actual practical performance when it comes to running this as an everyday PC. To start, I should mention that I've actually had this mini PC in my possession for about a month and a half at this point. Initially, I was working on the review, but then Mini's forum had some setbacks at their factory, and they asked me to hold off on the review until they could actually get their pre-orders fulfilled. And so I ended up testing this PC for an additional month while I was waiting for that green light. And I ended up using this PC for everything that I needed when it came to Windows, so all of the footage that you've seen in my videos over the past month, and that includes everything from tutorials with my Windows desktop, but then also some gameplay footage as well. And when when it came to everyday tasks, I had absolutely no problem. In fact, even when using it for something like video rendering, it did really well too. 
So what I'm doing right now is I'm cutting up one of my older videos here in DaVinci Resolve, and then I'm doing all the things you would typically do while video editing. And so I'm cutting everything up and then I'm moving it around and then I'm going to shrink it down to one minute of footage. From there, I'm going to export it as a 1080p video with 60 frames per second with a YouTube output. And so generally what I like to see here when I'm rendering a video is that the render time is less or about the same as the play time of the video itself. But as you can see here, the one minute of footage was actually done in 25 seconds. So that's pretty awesome. So I would say when it comes to everyday tasks, including video editing, photo editing, things like that, it's going to be great. Now I did run it through some gaming benchmarks as well. So if you're a numbers person, you like to follow this stuff, here's the time spy score here. However, one other test I did is a stress test. This is a 20 minute test here using TimeSpy. And there are a couple things of note right here. Number one is that it had a frame rate stability score of 94. And technically according to 3 d Mark, this means it does not pass the test. It should get at least 97% of consistent performance. Now as part of this test, it did 20 different one minute loops. And the average frame rate between the first and the last loop only dipped by one frame per second between everything altogether. But as you can see here, once we get to that 20th loop, you can see the frame rate is actually fluctuating quite a bit. If you look at the red line from the first loop, you can see that it stays pretty consistent where it boosts up and then kind of drops back down and then slowly kind of keeps up to that same frame rate. Meanwhile, with the 20th loop, which is the blue line, you can see it just kind of goes up and down quite a bit. We're not talking about huge dips here, but it is going down by maybe one or two frames per second consistently throughout that time. And if you look at it across the entire 20 loops right here, you can see that the frame rate consistently is about the same. But once we get to that 10th loop and beyond, we do get that kind of jaggedy performance. Now, to be honest, I'm really not smart enough when it comes to benchmarks to really say what's at play right here. But in the end, my guess here is that what we're seeing actually is just the fluctuation of the computer trying to regulate everything to make sure that we don't get over 80 degrees Celsius, but still get good performance. Like I mentioned, I have been testing this PC for over a month and I never actually noticed anything when it came to real world gameplay, but I did want to make a note of this just because I saw it in the testing. Anyway, those are my thoughts when it comes to the benchmarks and numbers, but let's get into the practical gameplay next. And we're going to start with PC gaming and I always test things in the same way. What I typically will like to do is try to keep everything at 1080p and I'll start at the easiest games and then work my way up from there. Generally after setting the 1080p, the next thing I like to do is just bump up the graphical fidelity as high as it'll go. And so for example with Ori and the Will of the Wisps, I'm running it at 1080p with the highest settings possible and it is running at a stable 60 frames per second. From there I like to move it up to the harder games, so next we have Halo Reach. This is running at 1080p original settings, and yeah, very stable 60 frames per second here as well. When it comes to competitive shooters, I'm not the best judge of these, but I usually will try Counter-Strike Go with the lower settings in 1080p. And as you see here, we're getting a stable frame rate of between 150 and 200 frames per second. And so if you have like a 144 hertz monitor, this should work out really well. Moving along, here's Street Fighter V, 1080p in high settings, and a stable 60 frames here as well. And same thing with your kind of middle tier games. These are what I would consider to be like Xbox 360 or Xbox One games. These can run at 1080p high settings and look great. When we start to move up to some of the harder to run games, something like Destiny 2, you will have to drop it down to low settings to maintain 1080p. And I would get a frame rate drop here every once in a while with Destiny 2, but overall I would say this is completely playable at this speed. I did find that some other games did struggle to maintain 1080p and 60 frames per second. Rise of the Tomb Raider is a good example. I saw this one dip down to around 50 frames per second here and there. And so if you do get to a game where you are not getting a consistent 60 frames per second, you have a couple options here. The first one would be to just drop the resolution. For example, with Control, I've dropped it down to 720p using low settings. And at these settings, we're getting a very consistent 60 frames per second. A lot of modern games will actually take advantage of AMD's FSR settings, and because we're using an AMD chip here, we can take advantage of those here. For example, with Resident Evil 3, at 1080p and medium settings, we can bump up the FSR quality setting, and that'll give us a stable 60 frames. And so if you are playing a more recent game and it has FSR settings, this is one of the things you could do. Now, if you want to have the sharpest graphics possible and you don't want to make a compromise by dropping it down to 720p or using FSR, another solution in a lot of more modern games is that you can drop the frames per second cap down from 60 to something like 30 instead. And so for games like Spider-Man or Red Dead Redemption 2, you can actually keep it at 1080p with some of the maybe lower or medium settings, but then you can drop the frames per second down from 60 to 30. That's going to give you a more consistent frame rate, but it won't be as silky smooth as 60 frames per second. 
Other games like Uncharted 4 can use both FSR as well as a frames per second cap to their advantage. So here we're running it at 1080p with a balanced FSR and a 30 frames per second cap and it's running great. And if you want to bump that up to even more, maybe you can get 40 frames per second stable, then you can use third party tools to do that. Either way, when it came to PC game testing using integrated graphics, I was just blown away by the UM690. It's kind of amazing to me that it's just a given that any PC game I throw at it will work. When it comes down to it, the main thing we're looking at here is how we can tweak the settings to get the best performance possible. And so I would say when it comes to PC gaming with integrated graphics, the UM690 is doing really well. And so with all that out of the way, let's move on to some emulation testing next. We're going to start with Nintendo systems and stick with those all the way up through the current generation. To start, we're going to do Nintendo 3DS, and I used a 4x resolution right here. And while a 4x resolution of a somewhat low resolution system doesn't sound that impressive, it still looks really good. And you also have to bear in mind that this emulator is actually rendering two different screens at the same time. On the bottom right, you can see the bottom screen. And so both of these screens are running at a 4x resolution and they're doing really well. So when it comes to 3DS emulation, I think this is going to be really good. You are going to get some stutters here and there when it comes to shaders caching, but overall 3DS is going to be great. Up next, we have Nintendo GameCube. And for this one, I also did a 4x resolution, which is the equivalent of a 1440p signal. And I'm happy to say that here we also got a stable 60 frames per second with any game I threw at it. That includes those medium tier games, things like Star Fox Assault and Soul Calibur 2, but then also some of those harder to run games like F-Zero GX. And so overall, if you want to play GameCube games at 1080p or even 1440p and beyond, this should be great. And I don't have any footage here specifically in Windows, but I did test it with Wii and same performance here as well. Either way, moving on to the next generation here of Wii U, this one also did really well. Many of these games natively run at 720p, and so what I did is I went into the settings and bumped them up to 1080p across the board. And as you can see here, every game I tried at 1080p ran at a full frame rate. Now Wii U is one of my favorite systems to emulate, so I was really happy to see that I could play every one of these games at a 1080p resolution. In fact, even Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild played at 1080p as well. Now unfortunately it didn't run at a stable 60 frames per second, but I did drop the frame rate cap down to 40 frames per second and it worked well. I would get a couple drops here and there as I was getting new shaders or pipelines caching, but overall, yeah, this was really great too. And so moving up to the current generation of Nintendo consoles, here's the Nintendo Switch. For this, I used the Yuzu emulator while in docked mode. So this means that the games will play in something like 720p or 1080p, depending on the game. Either way, I was really impressed by the Switch performance. Even when in docked mode, all these games were playing at full speed. Much like with the other systems, it would take a stutter here and there when it was caching a new shader, but it's one of those things that the more you play the game, the better it'll get. Even games like Super Mario Odyssey and Link's Awakening did really well when in docked mode. And so aside from compatibility with the emulator itself, I would say that yes, this is perfectly capable of playing Nintendo Switch games too. So now let's move over to Sony systems. I'm going to start with PS2 and we're going to bump the resolution up to three and a half times. Now the resolution on PS2 games is kind of wonky because it changed depending on the game, but overall I would say this is about a 1440p output. And like we saw with GameCube, we're going to get 60 frames across the board no matter what game we tried. And so yes, if you're looking for a mini PC that can give you consistent PS2 performance at at least 1080p or beyond, then I think the UM690 is going to be a good bet. Even the really hard to play games like God of War 2 did great. And then up next for Sony, we have PS3 emulation. For this one, I ran everything at the native resolution of the PS3, and this one also had some pretty impressive performance. Some of those easier to run games like Dead or Alive 5, absolutely no problem. But even some of those choke points that we find in other PS3 games were not that big of an issue. For example, in the open world of Prince of Persia, we got a stable 30 frames per second, which is really impressive without having a GPU. And even Ratchet and Clank Quest for Booty actually was very close to 60 frames per second. And much like with the B-Link mini PC that I tested with the same chipset, this performance is way better than I thought would be possible without a graphics card. Now PS3 emulation is still a work in progress. We have ways to go before it's going to be perfect. And so overall, I would say that yes, PS3 performance is very good on this machine, but that is working under the assumption that the game itself is going to work with the emulator. Okay, moving on, let's go to Microsoft. We'll start with the original Xbox. Here we're running the Zemu emulator at a 2X resolution. And quite a few of the games that I tested at a 2x resolution did run at full speed. However, I would say that the Xbox emulation here did lag behind the other consoles from this generation like the PS2 and GameCube when it comes to the compatibility and emulation performance. 
For example, we have Soul Calibur 2. On the GameCube, this one ran at a 4x resolution or a 1440p signal. But here on the Xbox, you can see here that it is dipping quite a bit below the 60 frames per second, even at a 2x resolution. Now we can go into the settings here and change the internal resolution scale to a 1x or native resolution, but even then, when we try to play Soul Calibur 2, we're still getting some consistent frame dips. And so yes, I would say here, when it comes to original Xbox emulation performance, it is gonna be kind of hit or miss. You're gonna have some of those standard compatibility issues, but then also performance is not as great as I was hoping either. Bumping it up to the next generation, Xbox 360, this one's a little bit unique as well. This is a system that just kind of struggles when it comes to compatibility, but when there is a game that does work correctly, it is pretty awesome to actually play it. And so games like Blue Dragon or Lost Odyssey or Gears of War, all these play really well. And the nice thing here is the Xbox 360 emulator is actually getting updated almost every single day. As an example right here for my testing, I updated to the most recent version of this emulator. And for the first time, I was actually able to play Crackdown in-game. Usually this game will crash within the first minute, and so it's pretty awesome to actually get into the city and shoot some bad guys. Now the sound isn't working just yet, and the overall brightness or exposure just seems to be a little bit too saturated as well, so it's not quite perfect, but it is pretty cool to actually get into the game like this. And so as Xbox 360 emulation matures, we should see some improved gameplay over time. Now another thing I like to do with my mini PC testing is to see whether or not Botticera is going to work. And if you're new to Botticera, this is a custom Linux firmware that is meant to be played with retro games. The beauty about this is that everything, the operating system, the games, the emulators, all can be loaded up onto one SD card or a flash drive or an external hard drive. In this case, I'm running everything off of a USB flash drive, and the first thing I want to test here is Xbox performance. Because generally, I found that this app will actually work better in Linux than it will in Windows. And sure enough, as you can see, we're actually running everything at 3x resolution or 1440p, and it's running at full speed. And so if emulation for the original Xbox is important to you, I would recommend checking out Botticera because the performance here is quite a bit better. And just because I feel bad for not showing Wii performance when we were showing off Windows emulation, let me show you off a little bit here when it comes to Botticera. And yeah, as you can see here, it's running at a 3x resolution or 1080p and absolutely no problem. And so overall, when it comes to emulation, you can do just about everything on the UM690. Both Windows and Linux do really well when it comes to emulation, but if you are concerned with the original Xbox, then I would say Botticera will be better in that regard. Okay, that was a lot of testing, let's move on to the summary and what I like and what I don't like about the UM690. To start, I really like the compact size. This is easily the smallest mini PC with this much power that I've seen to date. And I think the company's aware of what they have when it comes to that compact size because they also offer that vertical stand for those who have even less desk space than normal. As we saw in the testing, when it came to PC gaming and emulation, this thing just knocks it out of the park. Every PC game I tried would run, it's just a matter of whether or not I had to adjust the settings to make it optimal for the device. I also think the price to performance here is pretty darn good. At $650, we're getting a PC that is super small that can still play just about everything. I'm also amazed at how quiet this fan is considering how small the PC is altogether. I also appreciate that this device has Thunderbolt 4. That means you can plug in an external GPU or you can plug it into an 8K monitor if you had something like that. I also appreciated that I didn't have to do any sort of configuration under the hood. The default TDP seemed to work the best for me altogether. Now I'm really impressed with the UM690, but it is not perfect. There are a couple things that I would have liked to have seen better on this machine. Number one, I would have preferred to have a USB-A port on the front of the machine. For example, when I do PC gaming, I actually like to use a wired controller, and so because of that, I like to just plug it directly into the PC. And it is a little bit annoying to have to reach around the back of the mini PC to plug in a controller when you could have just done that right on the front. Additionally, I think that Thunderbolt 4 port would have done better on the back than on the front. I imagine most people are going to use that port to plug in something like a monitor or a external GPU, and so because of that, you probably want to have those wires at the back of the machine and not at the front. Additionally, I found the disassembly or teardown of the UM690 to be more difficult than I would have liked. The main thing for me here is that I don't like to have to take off those rubber feet at the bottom in order to access the screws, especially because you may want to get into the machine to swap out your RAM or add a hard drive, things like that. And so I wish there was a less destructive way to get inside the machine itself. And finally, as we saw in my stress testing, there are some potential thermal issues when you do use this machine at max capacity over time. After about 10 minutes, the performance gets a little bit wonky, at least when it comes to the numbers. Now, like I mentioned, I've tested this thing thoroughly over the past month, and I've never actually seen that when it comes to gameplay, but it is still something I thought was worth mentioning. 
Okay, and before we start wrapping up, let's do a quick comparison against the B-Link GTR6, which uses the same chip internally. Now, I'm going to assume that you've already watched the full video that I made about this about a month ago, and so we're going to move on from there to go to the actual comparison. To start, when it comes to the UM690, as you can see, it's quite a bit smaller in overall volume. It is a little bit taller than the GTR6, but not by much, and I would say the overall footprint is quite a bit smaller. Now when it comes to I.O. on the front, the B-Link has that USB-A port, which I really appreciate. But at the same time, the UM690 has a USB 4 port, which the B-Link one doesn't have at all. And so if you specifically are looking for a mini PC to use with an external GPU, then I think this one is a no-brainer. Now when it comes to I.O. on the back, it's a little bit mixed. For example, the B-Link has four HDMI ports. I'm not really sure if you would need that, but I personally don't. And all four of the USB ports on the UM690 are USB 3.2. Two of the B-Link ones are USB 2.0. Now when it comes to the bottom and actually getting into the device, I think the B-Link one is much easier. Not only are the screws directly in the rubber feet right here, so it's non-destructive, but it also has a nice little flap that you can pull up to actually access everything without having to wedge in a guitar pick. And finally, when it comes to the outer hardware, the B-Link has a couple bells and whistles that I really like too. For example, it has that cloth covering here on the top, but then it also has a fingerprint scanner right here. And this comes in really handy if you want to log into your PC without having to type in your password or PIN. And I really can't over state how much I like the cloth coverings on the B-Link machine. This is one of those things that I really didn't think that I would want, but once I actually had it in the hand, I was like, man, this actually looks really nice. And so when it comes to overall aesthetics and what I would actually like to see on my desktop, I think I would prefer the B-Link one over the Minis Forum one. Okay, so that's the hardware and aesthetics between the two. Let's talk a little bit about performance. If you remember from my Cinebench testing earlier in the video, the UM690 got a score of 12,434. And that's when using the default CPU TDP of 45 watts. And if you remember, the max temperature was about 80 degrees Celsius as well. Now the GTR6 has a 35 watt default TDP and when running the same test with that 35 watt TDP we're getting the same temperature of 80 degrees Celsius max. This says to me that the cooling profile on the UM690 is a little bit better than the GTR6 if it can get the same temperature at 10 watts higher TDP. Additionally, due to the fact that we're using that lower TDP, we have a lower Cinebench score too, about 14% lower than the UM690. Now it is possible to increase the TDP on the B-Link, and if you watch my B-Link video, you know that it was quite an endeavor to get that actually working. I wasn't able to do it accurately within the BIOS, so I had to use a number of different third-party tools until I finally tested a solution that worked. And unfortunately, that took me several hours to figure out, and even then, it's not a permanent solution, so you'd have to do that every time you boot up the PC to make sure it's at that higher TDP. And so that was one of the things I mentioned in my B-Link review, was that it's not very easy to adjust the thermals on that device. And so between the two, when it comes to out-of-box performance, I would say the Minis Forum wins hands down. Not only will it perform better at the default TDP because it's 10 watts higher, but the amount of adjusting that you have to do on the B-Link in order to get it to work is actually kind of a pain in the butt. And so I would say if you're relatively new to PC gaming in general and you just want something to work well out of the box, then the Minis Forum is a better bet. And then finally, let's talk about cost. So the barebone UN690 is $499, but the version I recommend is the $650 model with the 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. Now you could bump up the specs here. For example, you could get 32 gigs of RAM and that's gonna cost you $730 altogether. Personally, I think that 32 gigs of RAM is overkill on this machine unless you're gonna be consistently doing video editing. But either way, let's make a note of that $730 for the 32 gigs of RAM because it is gonna come into play here in a moment. Now moving over to the B-Link, you can see here the prices are a bit more than the UM690. For example, their bare bones price is $60 more than the other. Additionally, they do not offer a 16 gigabyte option like the one I was testing Testing. Instead, the only other model that comes preloaded is with 32 gigs of RAM. And as you can see here, it's $770 or $40 more than the other one in that regard. Another thing to bear in mind is that these are the prices as of today, and mini PC prices fluctuate a lot. For example, the GTR6 is already listed on Amazon, and as you can see, they're selling it for $970, but with a $50 coupon, so $920. Now that's like $150 more than actually buying it from B-Link, but if you actually consistently follow these Amazon price listings, you'll see it'll go left and right all the time. Either way, as of right now, when releasing this video, the UM690 prices are quite a bit lower than the B-Link 1. And given the fact that the UM690 has more consistent performance out of the box and has a smaller form factor too, this is going to be the one I recommend between the two. I think they are both really good mini PCs, and you can't go wrong with either of them. 
But for me, it's a pretty easy decision given the fact that it's lower price and better performance and smaller. Now, if you've watched my other mini PC videos, you know that I have a running spreadsheet right here of every mini PC I've ever tested. And these are sorted by the average price that I can find online and then also the performance that you can expect out of the machine. And so here is the Minis Forum UM690 here at $650. And it's kind of amazing it's at this price point because the other mini PCs that are around that same price, like these two here, are nowhere close to the UM690 when it comes to performance. In fact, the UM690 is in an entirely different league. And so previously I had listed the GTR6 as being my top pick when it came to mini PCs over $500. But for all the reasons that we just discussed, I'm actually going to move that over to the Minis Forum UM690 instead. And so, at least for now, the UM690 takes the crown. I'm really excited every time I move one of these top picks from one machine to the other, and so it's really cool to do that right now. Either way, as we wrap up the video here, one of the most consistent things I get asked is whether or not this device is going to be worth it. And I think when it comes to the UM690, you know what I'm going to say, and that yes, this thing is really great. The amount of performance that we're getting here for the price is just kind of mind-blowing compared to something that was released at the same time last year. And so if anything, this just makes me more excited to see what everything's going to be like about a year from now instead. As it stands right now, when it comes to price to performance, the UM690 is the best mini PC that I've tested to date. And so if you're in the market for a mini PC, I think this one's a pretty good bet. Anyway, let me know what you think in the comments below. Is the UM690 the one for you, or are you going to wait for the next greatest thing to release? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.